we're going to talk about aluminium and um, the dangers of aluminium. And um, Dr. Bill is going to um, offer solutions on how we can um, remove it from our bodies and improve our health. Now, uh, we're episode 163. The, um, the subject is aluminium detox, an easy solution for everyone. Welcome to SAMA, everybody. SAMA is a program in which we invite an expert to discuss a topic from their area of expertise. In this week's episode, we are delighted to have Dr. Bill McGraw with us. Dr. Bill is originally from the United States, but he has lived and worked in four other countries for a total of 19 years, including Panama, where he currently resides with his Panamanian wife. He has three degrees, three different majors, from three different universities, including a PhD in agriculture. Dr. Bill writes and publishes research articles in scientific journals and websites, while periodically teaching an online class called Basics in Agriculture. His current passion is healing people from chronic disease using Rife technology, heavy metal detox, and diet and lifestyle changes. During the last three years, he has published two books on heavy metals, both available on Amazon. Dr. Bill hopes to finish a degree in naturopathic medicine as soon as time and travel allow, which doesn't look like it's going to be any time soon because he's so busy. <laughs> in the meantime, he will continue his passion for research and publishing in the fields of health, agriculture, coral reefs, and GMOs. We've already had Bill and Sam before, in fact, twice before. He was on episode 101, where we discussed mercury toxicity. We came back together again in episode 154 of Sammer, where we discussed aquaponics and how we can create our own micro um, food systems, self-sustained food systems, which is very... Um, uh, timely in today's um, pandemic uh, times, uh, where you can grow your own healthy foods and ensure you get the micronutrients that you need. But today, we're going to discuss something which is quite insidious. Most people don't actually realize that it is actually a problem. We're going to talk about aluminium and uh, how it is toxic and what we can do about it. Bill, welcome to our show again. It's wonderful, or as always, to have you with us. Thanks very much for having me back, John. I really appreciate it. Now, we, when you talk about heavy metals, most people think about mercury and, and the metals that are physically heavy. Is aluminium a heavy metal? Uh, sure, sure it is. Um, but I got to say that aluminum, as I say aluminum when you say aluminum, uh, aluminum production really didn't begin until the 1880s. So in the environment, there really didn't exist any kind of appreciable amounts of pure aluminum because it's so reactive that it tends to bind to things. Uh, it can bind to silica. Normally, it's bound to silica in the environment. you got to realize that the top three elements in the Earth's crust are oxygen, silica, and aluminum. Aluminum is number three. But it really doesn't exist on its own in a pure form. It, it normally exists attached to something like, in particular, silica. But in the 1880s in the United States, they developed a process to remove aluminum from aluminum ore and produce pure aluminum. And that began, began really the age of aluminum. So worldwide aluminum production increased by a factor of about three times between 1975 and 2005. And currently there's about 70 million tons of aluminum produced. And the mining industry produces about 150 million metric tons of waste from the aluminum industry which is really toxic, has a pH of like 12 to 14, which is off the chart. And it is just so toxic that they generally don't recycle it. It exists in line ponds and sometimes it escapes and creates a lot of different problems. So the aluminum production industry, although aluminum is great metal, you know, it's not magnetic and it's so tough and it doesn't rust and all those things. It just is really hard on the environment and even harder on our bodies. Now, one of the things, or we could say the elements really, that's produced from aluminum uh, that has a strange uh, history and story is fluoride, 
Well, fluoride is one of the toxic residues or, or elements that's produced from uh, processing aluminum. And what do you do with a toxic waste product? Well, you put it in your drinking water. If and you you in the <laughs> <laughs> right. So 99.8% of all the drinking water in the United States contains at least two milligrams per liter of fluoride. And they put fluoride in the water. They first did it in Michigan, 1945. And that was to just decrease cavities. Uh, okay. But the problem is that it creates something called fluorosis. It eats the enamel off your teeth. Anybody who has a high fluoride concentration in their drinking water, you see their teeth don't look very good. And also it pulls minerals out of the bones and creates brittle bones. And it also calcifies ligaments and tendons. So right now, worldwide hip fractures total 1.7 million per year. This is expected to increase to 6.3 million uh, per, per year in the year uh, 2050. And so that's an outrageous amount. One of the reasons for it is uh, fluoride in our drinking water. Another one's going to be aluminum. Now, before we get into the bits and pieces of flor uh, aluminum, rather, in the human body and how you get rid of it and the toxic uh, problems that it causes, it's important to state that one of the means that aluminum gets into our food is from the soil. Now, 50% of all arable land is composed of acidic soils that has a pH less than 5.5. And anytime you have a low pH, aluminum becomes more soluble in the soils and the plants will absorb it. Well, aluminum is toxic to just about everything, bacteria, plants, animals, humans. It has no uh, apparent purpose in the human body or, or virtually in any organism. It's toxic to just about everything. And so plants have a, developed a way to deal with aluminum and acid soils. And that's by using something called oxalic acid or oxalate. And so to use the oxalate to bind aluminum, okay, or chelate it, and then push it out of the plant into the soils, or sometimes they, they uh, maintain high aluminum concentrations bound to oxalate. Now, when a person uh, ingests a plant that contains oxalate, it is inflammatory. And this inflammation causes all kinds of problems in the human body, uh, anything from pain, fatigue, insomnia, brain fog, cognitive disorders. Uh, if you take a long time to heal from injury, uh, that's inflammation. It could be from oxalates. And the typical plants that contain the, by far the most oxalates are spinach, buckwheat, and rhubarb. And these are plants that are grown on soils that contain aluminum and they will use oxalate to bind it. And they will contain higher amounts of oxalate or oxalic, oxalic, oxalic acid. And so you have to be wary of that. If you have a lot of inflammation, if you're dealing with problems with inflammation uh, that are very typical for somebody who has a lot of toxins in their body, it's something that you really need to be aware of. Anyone who takes a high amount of vitamin C as a lot of us do in this day and age with uh, the coronavirus and so on, uh, you need to be aware that oxalates can actually form from vitamin C if you have a high amount of iron or copper in your body and a low amount of vitamin B6. Um, oxalates can also chelate the good metals in your body. So, you know, unfortunately, when people talk about uh, good food to eat, they talk about uh, leafy greens, which are really good. They're, they help you with detoxification. Uh, and they talk about spinach, but unfortunately, spinach can be really high in oxalic acid. There's a type of spinach that grows here in Panama called the Mayan spinach. Um, it's got a couple other names too. Chaya, I think, is the, one of the other names, and it's very low in oxalic acid. It does contain some other uh, compounds that could be toxic, so you need to cook it first, but it's very super, super nutritious. They call it one of the superfoods, by the way. Now, oxalate is stored uh, in the body, primarily in the thyroid, and you need B6 and magnesium to help detox it detoxify it. And so normally people take B6 and magnesium when they're trying to detox from heavy metals. So the people are pretty familiar with those two supplements. Right, right. Uh, and so uh, let's see, um, if you have high iron and copper in your body and low vitamin uh, B6, then you, you uh, definitely need to be aware of oxalate. So we get on to what are the sources of aluminum in the human body? And as I mentioned, uh, aluminum is, is found just about everywhere these days. I mean, it's in your house, it's in your car, it's in your soil, it's in your water, it's in your, you know, your cosmetics, your, your basic everyday things, you really find it all over the place. And generally, we really didn't find that uh, so much back in the day, maybe go back 100 years, there wasn't a whole lot of aluminum around, but since we've learned to process, process it so very well and so cheaply, it's found everywhere. So uh, if we look at some of the big sources that are readily known, aluminum cookware is a biggie. Now, 
most of the time, if you live in the modern world, like the United States, the UK, and so on, you know that aluminum cookware is really bad because you'll get the aluminum toxicity from the cookware. But places like Panama, you could walk into a hardware store. I just walked into a hardware store a few weeks ago, and I noticed, hey, wow, there's aluminum cookware. And, it, and it's artisanally made. It's made by small family organizations. Aluminum has a low melting point, And it's easy yes. to work with. And it's fun to work with. We used to work with it back in school, in, in grade school, making different things with molds. We learned how to make molds and so on. But if you have aluminum cookware, aluminum utensils, you can receive 125 milligrams per time that you're using it to cook for meals. So, so that's... That uh, uh, I'm going to read your book. Um, that's the thing that really amazed me, just the absolute volume of aluminum that leaches out from the aluminum saucepans and uh, other utensils. Mm -hmm. Just the volume is... We're all like grams, almost in the gram. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really high, it, easily 125 milligrams per it's meal terrible. if you're going to use aluminum cookware. So this is going to be one of the big things when you, you hear about stories of people having Alzheimer's. And it, it, a lot of times it'll come back, oh, well, she had aluminum cookware. She used aluminum uh, uh, coffee pot or something like that. And over time, over a year, you can really become aluminum toxic. So that's one of the biggies. It, that's easily avoidable. Get rid of your aluminum cookware. Don't use it. Use a different form of metal besides aluminum. So that's a big one. Easily avoidable, by the way. Another one is tap water. Take a country like the United States, 50% of all the water in the United States contains at least 0.1 milligrams per liter of aluminum. And why is that? It's because um, when we, we process water for use in a domestic application, we use aluminum sulfate to flocculate. And flocculate just means we add aluminum sulfate to water to get rid of particles. And it settles the particles out. But there's still aluminum residue in the water at 0.1 milligrams per liter. Well, that's been associated in the scientific literature to produce symptoms of Alzheimer's and people get Alzheimer's, uh, they can relate this directly to having aluminum in the tap water, in particular people who don't detoxify very well for, from heavy metals. And we call these poor, poor detoxifier, detoxifiers or poor methylators. Go ahead. That's very interesting. The, um, now, when I was, um, a, few, a few years ago, I was working for Coca-Cola and we used aluminium to flocculate the, uh, the water, which is, Causes you know, the heavy the solids to settle down of the tank. Right. And they changed to iron. Mm -hmm. they, the, at that time, they did not give the reason why, but it was an unspoken truism that it was because it was uh, to avoid court cases later on where Coca Cola might be causing Alzheimer's, which was, uh, they made the change very early, which is commendable. And um, I, I, I remember. Again, I remember iron chelates uh, phosphates in the water. I remember that years ago from reading all kinds of research papers in aquaculture, but iron uh, will chelate phosphate. So that might've been part of the issue. But normally in the United States, when we're talking about um, processing water for domestic use, it's uh, aluminum sulfate. And that still can continues today to this very day. It's almost this border on criminal, isn't it? Because it's not an, an, it's not an uncertain thing. People know that aluminum causes harm to the body. They know that there are long-term health consequences. Mm -hmm. Authorities know that it's proven, it's not arguable. Mm -hmm. Yet purposely adding aluminium into the water, okay, they say it's flocculation. They will say, well, okay, it settles near the bottom so it doesn't get through, which it does, because right. it has 0.1 milligram per liter. And, of course, they add the fluoride for good measure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, we live in a mad world. The further you do, go down the rabbit hole, the more you realize that you have to keep going to get to the bottom of it. And mm -hmm. what you realize at the end of the day um, is that th it's really quite a story. And that's really why I got turned on to writing these books and investigating all this. Because when I come up with these facts like you, I was just so surprised to read this. And I said, this can't be true. Huh? And then what else is there? And I kept going and going and going until I got to the end. And and uh, at the end of the writing of the book and realizing all these different things, you just have to ask yourself why. <laughs> but the good news is, and I have a lot of good news to share. It's not so easy yeah. to have come yeah. up with the good news with mercury, but <laughs> aluminum, the aluminum has a lot of good news. For instance, if you have a 
a, a cartridge filter, like a Brita water filter or a zero water filter, they can remove 100% of the aluminum out of drinking water. It's not expensive. It's very quick, actually. You could filter a liter of water in, in minutes and remove all of the aluminum. And you can measure that with, some, with an inexpensive, inexpensive digital meter called a TDS meter or total dissolved solids. And you'll find that when you filter this water through a zero water filter, it'll come out zero in TDS or milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids, including get rid of the aluminum. So uh, this is a, a happy story. You can get rid of all the aluminum out of the tap water. Just put it through a good filter that contains activated carbon and it contains a, an ion exchange resin, which will remove all the heavy metals. So that's a, an easy one to do if you know what you're doing and you have the knowledge to avoid that problem. Uh, the next one I'd have to say is medicines. And this was a mind blower for me. Uh, uh, the thing we're talking about primarily is antacid tablets. My father used to eat them like candies from, yeah. from acid reflux, but they contain 500 milligrams of aluminum per tablet. And let's say a half third, a gram, half a gram, for, <laughs> half a gram of aluminum in each tablet. And then, yeah. even as a, even as a child, as a relatively uneducated child, I used to think to myself, these, it contains aluminum oxide. Like, hang on a moment. And even then, I knew aluminium was bad. It was a metal, and, it's, it's, and it contains half a gram per tablet. You might as well just chew on, chew on a metal pot. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, a third of the people in the modern world are going to suffer from acid reflux or too much acid in the stomach over time. And 25% and of those people are going to rely on some form of chewable antacid tablets. So you're talking about 100 million people at the very least. And this is going to be a big source of aluminum into the body. Now, on, on, the, on the basic, uh, the, the label on this package of the, of the antacid tablets, it'll say, do not consume too many of these because it cause, causes neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So when you see that, and then the modern medicine will say, well, we really don't know what causes Alzheimer's and well, we really don't have a cure for it, but we would like to continue the $40 trillion worth of, of grants to figure it out. And lo and behold, there, when you come upon something like uh, an antacid tablet that openly says, look, you don't want to consume too much of this. It contains aluminum. It's going to kill you. If you eat too many, it's going to give you Alzheimer's. Think of this, get this, this is madness, but one out of every three people over the age of 80 is going to die from Alzheimer's disease in the modern world. And it's going to increase to one out of every two people in the next 25 years. That is madness. And what we're talking about is sources of aluminum and of course, mercury. And, and even we're going to eventually talk about glyphosate on one of these podcasts, eventually one of these salmons. <laughs> I think I've done one, I'm going to do one, I'm glad to say, but it's it's another incredible, one of those incredible stories. So avoid the antacid tablets by all means. It uh, and you know, the problems with um, not having enough uh, acid in your stomach are too much or often related to diet. It could be genetic related, but it's often related to mineral deficiencies and poor diets. The next one is processed foods. You can take in 24 milligrams of aluminum every single day just by consuming a lot of processed foods. You'll consume about 10 milligrams per liter if your diet contains a whole lot less processed foods. The biggest sources of process of aluminum and processed foods are things like cake mixes. Uh, Ready-made pancake mixes can give you 100 milligrams of aluminum per serving. Some any kind of powdered mix, like a milk powdered mix, uh, even some of these cheap cheeses that you get on uh, frozen pizzas or say the macaroni and cheese mixes often contain aluminum because they help with the processing or they help yeah. with uh, the flow of the of the of the product right. free, a free flowing agent when you buy salt <laughs> that contains a free flowing agent that is a double talk for poison it's double talk for aluminium okay so when you buy your salt it's got free flowing agent that's what uh, it is isn't it terrible yeah, uh, I can't make just say it contains poisonous aluminium, so people can make a, a informed decision. Why okay. do people do uh, research? Uh, the only way to avoid that is just to avoid processed foods and eat whole foods. Yeah. Grow your food like what we talked about in the aquaponics mm. bit and, mm. and just educate yourself. And you can avoid this stuff. It's a doable. It's a happy story. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so avoid processed foods. The next one is tea. Now, everybody, geez, all over the world drinks tea. But tea is a plant that can really tolerate high oh, aluminum right. concentrations in its mm. tissue. And you can get 4.2 milligrams of aluminum per liter of tea. But generally what happens, how we survive a lot of this 
it, when people drink a lot of tea is that a uh, very limited amount of aluminum is absorbed through the intestine when you're taking it. So that's whether uh, foods or, or sometimes uh, drinks that you're drinking regularly, you generally don't absorb most of it. It goes through you. It could be bound in the gut. If you're, if you're taking uh, orthosilicic acid, say from mineral waters, or your, maybe you've got a good amount of glutathione in your body, you will chelate that. A lot of the times it just passes right through the gut. So that's one of the ways that we survive it. You, you, you talk faster than you did before the other seminars are about how to squeeze in the questions. This one question is just um, coming from Liz uh, Van. She's asking, uh, what about the free-flowing agents and supplements? Do, uh, do they often use aluminium and supplements as well? Health supplements, I guess she's talking about here. Okay, that you're going to have to do your homework. The yeah. supplement market is a trillion dollar a year industry. And, you know, you're going to have to buy your supplements from reputable sources. That's the big thing. And I'll tell you what to do. Do what I do is contact the company and say, look, ask them questions. I ask uh, companies about chlorella and spirulina or about their mercury contents, because remember, algae absorb mercury in the body, but they also absorb mercury in the environment. So algae yeah. could actually be a source of mercury. So I, I contact the people and I say, when's the last time you've, you've uh, measured the mercury in your product? And they'll be happy to tell you oh yes we measure it every so and so and here's the analysis and they gave me the original data sheets and i could see that the there's no mercury in their product so if they're conscious of that and they're measuring it chances are that they're a reliable source but don't get a supplement that's super cheap by an unknown company and if you have questions go to the company ask them send them an email I, they have toll-free numbers use them ask them say you know i'm concerned about aluminum and i'm concerned about heavy metals what what do you know about that and if this company that you're talking to is worth anything. They will be able to say, oh, no, we sample for that or we're aware, well aware of that and this contain mm -hmm. that and, and it's generally free of, of heavy metals. So, yeah, Thank I do you. that and I think everyone should do that. Right, right. Okay. So... Um, go ahead. You, <laughs> no, no, um, in, in the um, EDTA and the... Um, and the uh, glutathione. Glutathion. Well, I'll, I've got a couple of questions for them, but maybe at the end of the summer because... Um, Maybe you're going to touch on that with regards to the solutions because you're talking more about oh, yeah. the problem at the moment. So I yeah, no, we're gonna. I'm gonna save the best for last. We're gonna. It's a, it's a happy. Like I said, it's a happy ending story. There is okay. a way that it's cheap and super super effective to get all the aluminum out of your body. And there's what's been well documented in scientific studies that orthosilicic acid and mineral waters can remove all the aluminum in a matter of months to potentially to a year's worth of time of drinking it every day. And it's it's cheap compared to a lot lot of uh, supplements and a lot of different types of therapies. So there is a happy ending at this store. I'm getting through the, the mean stuff first, and then we're going to get to the happy stuff later. Okay, finishing up, there's a couple more things we need to talk about. One of them is aluminum and antiperspirants. Uh, generally, there's a small amount of aluminum that's absorbed when you use an antiperspirant that contains aluminum, but there's a lot of aluminum. It's an aluminum, I think, chlorohydrate that's in antiperspirants, and that's it could be about 70 milligrams per application. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been associated with breast cancer. The areas of uh, the breast right next to the underarm is primarily where you find breast cancer developing. And that's well documented in peer reviewed scientific studies. And so the way to avoid that is just by not having an antiperspirant that has aluminum. They're widely available now. You know, if you spend your dollars correctly, the companies in the industry will follow you. You find that. So if you don't like something, don't spend your money on it. Find something that's better. And the, and the industry will say, wow, look at all the money that's in this. Yeah. And then they'll develop yeah. it and you'll get away from it. And so I've, noticed this too. Oh, go ahead. I've noticed this, how um, there's been a shift away from mercury-free products. And they'll say on the label now, contains no mercury. I'm oh, sorry, right. mercury, aluminium, contains no aluminium. So, right. And right. I'll, I'll be quite pleased to see that there is that movement. So um, if more and more people become aware and buy only products that don't contain the aluminium and other right. nasties, more well, industry will follow because they've, you know, they want to sell product. Absolutely. Uh, the last one is sunscreen. You can get 200 milligrams of aluminum from sunscreen. So uh, the bottom line is there's uh, natural sunscreens. Uh, you can use coconut oil or avocado oil, and they give you two to five times the protection that you normally would have. Now, most people these days, we talk about vitamin D to avoid uh, problems with the, your immune system, and they recommend taking 10,000 international units of vitamin D a day. Well, if you get 20 minutes of sun, 
uh, a day, chances are you're gonna easily make 10,000 international units of vitamin D, it comes in the best form of vitamin D3. So don't apply sunscreen, try to get a bit of sun and just a light pink color if you're a white person like I am, light skin, uh, then you just need a light pink color on the skin that has been exposed and over time you develop a tan and you build up uh, melanin and then you'll need a little more sun, but regular sun exposure, fantastic for getting all the vitamin D that you need, building the immune system and low vitamin D is associated with glutathione you hear me talk about that in some of the other podcasts um right. so, I mean, so, we all live in panama bill so <laughs> some of us live in gloomy countries they don't get much of the sun peeking past the clouds so um yeah yeah um then i there's different ways maybe there's uh lamps and so on you could probably get some uh, vitamin d3 production then you want to maybe take a, a vitamin d supplement Ten thousand interna international units is often uh, uh, good enough to to have the vitamin good enough for a vitamin d3 concentration in the human body so okay um next aluminum toxicity and and then we're going to move on to the the easy solutions that i talk about in my book uh, aluminum toxicity it interferes with atp production you're going to find this a lot with heavy metals and toxins. They are always interfering with energy production. People always have uh, a fatigue when, when they're toxic. That's one of the biggest things I hear. Well, I'm really tired or I'm insomnia and so on. So, uh, yeah, aluminum definitely interferes with ATP production, which is the main energy molecule of the human body. Uh, aluminum readily binds to proteins and things like citrate in the human body, which are actually good for you and help you remove uh, kidney stones. Meanwhile, I think I said calcium oxalate is 80% uh, of all kidney stones are calcium oxalate. That's another reason you want to watch your oxalates, which are inflammatory. Uh, aluminum can take the place of iron and calcium in the body and it gets transported around the body in enzymes that normally use iron and calcium, but aluminum can take the place of that. Uh, so can mercury for something like hemoglobin and render the protein useless. So you have to be careful. Aluminum is really reactive in the human body. One of the biggest things that blew my mind when I started really getting into the papers on toxicity in aluminum is that there were experiments that showed that 85% of all the aluminum ingested in the human body ends up in the brain. And I thought, whoa, hello, Alzheimer's. Uh, and yeah. there's two reasons for that. One is that just aluminum has an incredible affinity for nerve cells. The second thing is that nerve cells are the longest living cell in your body. And over time, these other cells that pick up aluminum, they die they get replaced and that aluminum gets you know, basically recycled back into the blood and into the body and picked up by another cell or protein and so on. But if it's attached to a nerve cell in the brain and it easily passes the blood brain barrier, by the way, it's going to get stuck there until it's aggressively removed through a detox detoxification procedure, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Okay, so when we're talking about aluminum, the number one problem is Alzheimer's. As I mentioned, one out of three people over the age of 80 is going to die from Alzheimer's in the modern world. It's going to increase to one out of every two people, well-documented and peer-reviewed scientific journals. But there is a genetic predisposal to um, having a problem with aluminum, and that's called the APOE genetic variation. And what this genetic variation does is create excessive amounts of amyloid beta proteins. Now, you've, if you've studied Alzheimer's, you know what that is because the aluminum attaches to that protein and disfigures it and creates a plaque. And once you have amyloid beta plaques, it's an automatic giveaway that you're developing Alzheimer's and you develop the Alzheimer's symptoms. Isn't that um, crazy? Like, so when people talk about Alzheimer's runs in the family, it's not that. It's their sensitivity to, sensitivity to aluminum and what aluminum does. <laughs> Yeah, basically they're poor chelators or they develop increased amounts of amyloid beta, which is uh, the amyloid beta proteins is more vulnerable to the aluminum. And then when you have mm -hmm. aluminum, it's, it per, the, the body is not as good as repairing the amyloid beta proteins. And so it, it can increase, increase the aluminum binding toxicity by about 10 times when you have the APOE variation in your genes. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Alzheimer's primarily in the literature, you'll find a lot of studies that talk about aluminum in drinking water, 0.1 milligrams per liter. People who drink that tap water regularly develop Alzheimer's type symptoms. 
And the way to remove it, what we're going to talk about is orthosilicic acid, which goes through the uh, blood brain barrier, just like aluminum does, attaches to the aluminum and takes it out of the body. Aluminum and silica have a thing going on. They attach to each other and it's a really hardcore bond. And that's how you get rid of aluminum out of the body. So aluminum attaches to neurons, attaches the myelin sheath uh, on the neurons. And this is what creates the autoimmune disorder. As the aluminum gets attached to the myelin sheath and the nerve cell, the body recognizes that as something foreign. foreign. It amounts uh, an immune response and starts attacking right. the body's own tissue. And so uh, this, as well as amyloid beta proteins that are disfigured, there's something called a tau protein, which aluminum also disfigures. And so we get these dis disfigured proteins and, and disfigured nerve cells. It really creates the problem of Alzheimer's in the area of the brain known as the hippocampus. The hippocampus is primarily the area affected when we're talking about Alzheimer's. And this is the area where a lot of mercury accumulates. And this is the area where a lot of glyphosate accumulates. So as I go further and further down the rabbit hole, I find an abundance of toxins creating the same problem, contributing to the same types of diseases, but also in reference to that, we also have the same type of ways of getting rid of those toxic uh, compounds. So what else? Um, so yeah, I mentioned the aluminum interferes with the body's ability to prevent and decrease the formation of amyloid beta plaques. Cardio disease, aluminum interferes with the fat and glucose stored for energy and increases the likelihood of developing cardiovascular disease. I mentioned something about osteoporosis and mineral loss in the bones but from, uh, from fluoride in the water, well, the same thing happens with aluminum because aluminum will actually take the place of calcium in the bones, creating a weaker bone structure. And this is di directly contributing to the problems with hip fractures. I can't tell you how many of my clients have, have had hip fractures, how many of my clients have already had hips replaced with some sort of titanium metal. And I tell them, look, you, you had one hip replacement, you're going to have to replace the other one, you're going to have to replace your elbows, your knees and every other joint in your body unless you solve the problem of mineral deficiencies. The mineral deficiencies are due to the heavy metal toxicity, the heavy metals taking the place of the good metals, you're creating weak bones, you're mineral deficient, the body will pull minerals out of the bones to satisfy a metabolic requirement to keep you alive. And in the process, you're developing weaker bones. So as our soils become deficient in minerals and our diet is crap and we're eating processed foods, our bones are becoming weaker and they break. And instead of solving the mineral deficiencies, what do we do? Oh, well, we just get a titanium hip replacement, an elbow replacement. You're gonna have to replace every joint in your body until you solve the problem. And that is mineral deficiencies and heavy metal toxicity. Okay. Yeah. That's that's all the bad news. The rest is nothing but good news. I know that's a lot of stuff. And I'm, I'm a type A personality that I want to tell you all about everything because I feel like this information is so important. I know people can review this this um, this podcast and this video several times and really get the gist of everything going on with aluminum. And of course, once I go down the rabbit hole, I never stop until I get the very end. <laughs> and so... What are the sources of silica in the diet? Orthosilicic acid is simply a form of silica in a particular mineral water or in a water that has a lower pH. So what are the sources of orthosilicic acid in the diet? Let's go through that first. If you go onto the internet, like I did when I first started this search, probably a year, year and a half ago, when I first became interested in it, and I said, Look, if I if I know I'm aluminum toxic and I get a hair sample test and it shows up aluminum and I see I have deranged mineral transport and my minerals are high and low and they're out of whack and I, I know it's due to heavy metals, I've done my homework, aluminum's coming out into the blood as I'm detoxing. It's transferred from the organs where it's stored in the brain and the uh, liver and the kidney. It's transferred into the blood. Around it goes into the blood through the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, the gallbladder. It's attached to glutathione or it's attached to silica and it goes out through the gastrointestinal intestinal tract every single day of your life. So I go onto the internet and I say, well, mighty internet, what if I'm aluminum toxic? What do I do? And what comes up is eat more green beans. And I thought, ha, huh, it can't be that easy. But in fact, there's a bit of truth to that. Green beans contain 2.5 milligrams per 100 grams of sample of green beans. And that's a high amount of orthosilicic acid. Now, the second thing you need to be aware of is the percent absorption from the orthosilicic acid or the silica from the food and green beans have a 50% absorption. So you've got a, a, a vegetable that's high in silica or orthosilicic acid, and it's got a good percent absorption 
So ding, 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 tell him what he's won, Johnny. Uh, that's a good thing to eat if you're high in aluminum. So your mother was right when she said, eat your vegetables and eat your green beans because it comes up again and again and again. The way to deal with all these toxicities is, you know, eat your vegetables 64 times more uh, antioxidants and it contains minerals and so on. So green beans are the way to go. So what else? Whole oats. But you find out when you're talking about grains, you have to be careful because it has to be organic because there's a lot of glyphosate used on grains now just to dry the crop out to make yeah. it easier to harvest. So you really yeah. have to think about doing uh, organic because some of the highest glyphosate concentrations in foods are on legumes that aren't even GMOs, that aren't even Roundup ready, that aren't even supposed to be used with glyphosate, but they are because it, it's a processing thing. If you apply glyphosate to the, the, the crop, it'll dry out quick. The seeds will be synchronized to develop all at the same time. And it's easier, it comes down to money, right? So you should get try to get organic whole oats. The whole oats is, is important because on the outside, of the grain is where all the orthosilicic acid and the silica is. So you have to consume the whole product and not just a processed oat. Now, the good thing is with all oats, you can get 278 milligrams of silica or orthosilicic acid per meal and it's 49% absorbable. So we're looking at another, another uh, potential thing you can eat that's just not only high in silica, but it's absorbable. Mm -hmm. And the other last two I'll talk about, there's a whole list of them. You can check them out online or in my book is barley. Barley is 109. It's 49% absorbable. There's a lot of barley in beers. Some type of beers contain barley, such as like the Indian pale ales are high in barley and sometimes hops. And these particular grains are high in orthosilicic acid and can be some of the highest uh, liquid orthosilicic acid concentration liquids you can find anywhere. So have a beer now and again and, and get one that's high in orthosilicic acid. You can look it up online or, or look at my book or look in this book. Da, da, da. Uh, this is called Silica Water, the Secret of Healthy Blue Zone Longevity by Dr. Dennis Krause. And he goes over and he lists all the different beers and all the different liquids that contain orthosilicic acid. And the last thing I'm going to point out, and there's others, but it'll take forever is that potatoes. Potatoes contain 93 milligrams of orthosilicic acid per serving, and it's 21% 20, absorbable. So it's a good option. However, uh, most all of the silica is obtained in the skin. So when you're eating your potatoes, you're scrubbing your potatoes, a lot of people say to me, well, what about the, you know, the toxins on the vegetable? And I say, well, to get rid of glyphosate, for instance, you can soak your vegetables in uh, a teaspoon per two cups of water of sodium bicarbonate, right? And that you can soak it for 15 minutes and give it a scrub and you'll get rid of the majority of glyphosate on the skin. And then you can wash the skin and, and eat the skin of the potato that contains the silica. So those are, there's a lot of foods out there. They're all vegetables, uh, some grains, definitely not meat. Meat doesn't contain much in the way of silica. Also things like seafood don't contain much in the silica. So it's all gonna come down to your vegetables. Right now all the vegan people are going crazy and. And they, they like that fact, but that's your, those are just the facts. And, and sure enough, vegetables are mighty good for you and some of the grains too that are grown organically. Go so those are some of the things. Uh, so uh, go ahead. A couple, okay. <laughs> a couple of questions to come in. One from uh, Joel. Um, Joel asked, do you have an opinion on using MMST, which is monomethyl uh, selenitriol as a silica source for chelating aluminium? Mm, I haven't heard of that one. Okay. Um, I do get approached by a number of different companies that are asking me, look, we have this product, but it, you know, I told them flat out, look, you know, people don't have a lot of money these days. People are out of work. The times are tough. It's going to come down to, you know, the cheapest and most widely available thing. And yeah. it's often going to come down to orthosilicic acid and water. I'm going to tell you how you can make your own orthosilicic acid water. It's very easy. It's pretty cheap. It takes a little while but it's a definitely doable thing. Uh, but the easiest and best way is that, and also glutathione, or as you mentioned earlier in the podcast here, uh, the EDTA will also chelate uh, not only aluminum, but other metals. So I haven't heard of that compound, but uh, I can tell you there's probably, it's probably more expensive than say a glutathione yeah. or okay. the orthosilicic acid. So we get to the orthosilicic acid. What is it? Well, in certain mineral waters, such as Fiji or Volvic, 
uh, or there's a few, there's others. You can look it up online or look it in, in, up in uh, Dr. Uh, Dennis Krause's book here. It's, it's really an awesome book. There's a couple of other books I'll mention. Age of Aluminum by Bert uh, Er Gardner and also Dr. Chris Exley, who's known as Mr. Aluminum. This is the book. Hopefully you can see that. You can find it on Amazon. Awesome book. Uh, really discusses everything to do with the aluminum industry and detox. So getting back to our story, uh, Fiji water can become a little become a little bit pricey over time. It's about two dollars and fifty cents here in Panama. You can't find it anywhere because people are finding out about aluminum, especially during the past couple of years, and they want to detox aluminum for maybe vaccines. So they're getting into understanding how the silica in water can really remove all the aluminum in your body, including what's already attached to nerve cells in the brain. So this was really exciting. This is a cheap and easy way for people to really do that, and you can't find. Fiji water anywhere in Bukete. Not a single store will have it because people have found out about how good it is. Now, the other water is vulvic water. Fiji water contains about, I think about 90, let's say about 45 milligrams per liter of orthosilicic acid. Vulvic water probably contains half that. So you want a higher concentration of, of silica in the water because it chelates more aluminum. But According to the YouTube videos you're going to see online created by Dr. Dennis Krause, you can make your own orthosilicic acid water. And that's by just using psyllium silicate and water, okay, added to a water of a low pH generally, okay, that's going to be your distilled water, your filtered waters of a low TDS or total dissolved solids. And then you're going to add your sodium silicate in a small amount of water, and you're going to microwave it to heat it up a bit to, to solubilize it or dissolve it. Then you're going to add it to water. You're going to add some sodium bisulfate, not sulfite, sul sulfate. And that's going to make the, the silica more soluble. And then you're going to add some minor minerals if you want to, and then create an orthosilicic acid water that you just drink throughout the day, three times a day, an eight ounce cup. And in a matter of weeks, it's been experimentally shown through research studies to remove aluminum from the body, including the aluminum in the brain. It prevents aluminum from being absorbed by the body if you're drinking regularly and there's aluminum in your food or your products or your antacids or whatever. And it's really the awesome way to go either through your mineral waters, take a magnifying glass with you to the supermarket and look at that silica concentration because it's so small, most of us can't really see it. Uh, but, you know, the easy way to do that is orthosilicic acid in the water. And that is the big answer. Also, remember your foods that you're eating that contain silica. Oh, the big answer here, the beautiful big answer that makes everyone happy and can fix anybody's problem with Alzheimer's is that avoid the products that have aluminum, avoid the potential aluminum introduction in the human body, use the right organic vegetables to get rid of the aluminum and then use the orthosilicic acid and then case closed we move on to the next toxin and the next story now the last part of this that i want to go through that's super important and it's so amazing is that there was a book written by um, eric butner i think it was it's called the blue zone now he's a guy from national geographic and he went into now what is a blue zone a blue zone is an area where there's an extraordinary amount of people living to beyond the age of 100. Now, it's not just a couple more. It's more like twice or three times the amount of people are living beyond the age of 100. So some inquisitive people like yours truly want to know, well, why is that? So this guy, and this is a book's probably 10 years old already, goes into these blue zone areas and they're in uh, islands in the Mediterranean. There's one area in Costa Rica. Uh, and there's a few, there's one in China. Believe it or not, there's one actually in the mainland China. It's but it's mostly in like areas of islands. I don't know why that is. It's just mineral waters that contain silica. But back in the day, you know, this guy went in and he looked at what were the factors that create the conditions that allow these people to live more than a hundred. So many of them are more than a hundred. And what he found out were things like, well, it was revealed that there was uh, magnesium and calcium in the water and they had good family relationships and they ate good uh, whole foods and they didn't eat processed foods and the processed diet generally reversed the entire effect. So if, a, if an, an area became more modernized and they switched to a processed food diet, it, it, it made everything null and void and the, the whole blue zone thing was canceled. The blue zone effect was completely canceled. So it did have to do with the diet. It did have to do with the water, but not necessarily from the magnesium and calcium. It had to do with the silica. They went into these blue zone areas in the second book, 
And the second book is the, the, the Dr. Dennis Krauss book. And he went into these blue zone and he measured the amount of orthosilicic acid as well as 12 other elements. And the only element in the water that was positively correlated with people living to beyond the age of 100 was the orthosilicic acid. So then he went to all blue zones and measured it, every single water that people were drinking. And he found the same thing every time. The orthosilicic acid was higher in concentration compared to other areas. And if you lived in the blue zone, you had all these amazing benefits. Some of the benefits, 80% decrease in arteriosclerosis compared to people who are not living in the blue zone. So if you're living in a place like the United States or the UK or modern area, you're going to have a much greater increase in arteriosclerosis, 80% increase. So that is one. And one of the reasons for that is silica is very good for arteries. It makes them more elastic and it leads to fewer problems with uh, higher blood pressures and arteriosclerosis. If you live in an area like the US, you're gonna find there's a five times higher chance of being affected by heart disease and a seven times higher chance of developing prostate cancer compared to people that live in the blue zone. And this is widely documented, not only in this book, where this guy goes into great detail about these studies that he's conducted. But you're going to find, if you go into the scientific literature, you're going to find papers where people are looking at the blue zone. They're going to demonstrate statistical significance and statistical relevant correlations of people living in the blue zone that are drinking this water. And they're coming up with all these lesser problems with chronic disease and they're living to a greater age over 100. It's outrageous. Uh, there, say, for instance, this island, island in the Mediterranean called the Icaria, they have a 50% less amount of heart, heart disease compared to Americans. And I think I mentioned 80% less chance of developing breast and, breast and prostate cancer compared to people living in the United States. And those are just some of the highlights. There are more. But those are some of the facts and figures that I'm looking at going, this just can't be true. So I went back into the literature. I went back into the white papers and the science journals. And lo and behold, wow, it is true. They have the data. It is complete. It has been published and peer reviewed. And it's just an awesome amount of evidence to, to tell you, look, this orthosilicic acid is not a fad. It's not an alkaline water. It's not a H water. It's not this and that. This is a regular real thing where it caused me to say, look, let water be thy medicine. I know they say, let food be thy medicine, Hippocrates. Well, I'm saying let water be thy medicine. Let water heal you. Anybody who's trying to detox needs to drink a lot of pure filtered water to get rid of all their trash, where they're talking about EMFs, you're talking about heavy metals, you're talking about glyphosates, you're talking about any kind of toxins. Remember, sweat therapies are super important. You can actually sweat out your uh, undigested prescription drugs through your sweat glands as well as all your heavy metals. Okay. <laughs> got a few questions to ask you. I'm right. jumping back to the second question I was going to ask before. Um, soaking vegetables in uh, water and vinegar, does that help to yeah. remove? Okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You're talking about t uh, 15 minutes and about, it's something like a tablespoon or maybe two tablespoons and about a couple cups of water. You soak your vegetables, your fruits in there for 15 minutes. And then you can even give them a little bit of a scrub, rinse them out of the tap. And that will remove the, the majority of the herbicides, pesticides. But when we're talking about glyphosate, we're talking more along the lines of sodium bicarbonate. It seems to have a bigger advantage. And that's yeah. like, a tablespoon per two or three cups of water. You're soaking again for 15 minutes and then you're rinsing. You can even give it a bit of a scrub or mm -hmm. just go organics. People are more and more around here are, grow are growing their own foods because they realize the dangers of glyphosate. And there's more glyphosate used in Panama than anywhere in the world. People use it here by the ton. I don't think they understand the toxicities involved, but mm -hmm. absolutely vinegar is very good. It can be the any white distilled vinegar you get from the, from the major outlets. Okay, now a really good question asked by uh, Chiron Monday, and uh, <clears throat> I'd love to know what your answer is. If a person already has Alzheimer's disease, and then they remove all the aluminium using the orthosilicate acid, um, can they totally reverse the disease? Yes, if it, if <clears throat> absolutely. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, if it's a really at an advanced stage, it's hard to deal with all kinds of 
dead neural tissue in the human brain. But if it's his early symptoms or mid-stage symptoms where the person has really only experienced symptoms for a matter of months to, to a year, then it's totally reversible. It's well-documented. I think oh. this guy in this book here talks about how his mother was suffering from Alzheimer's because she was using aluminum cooper. I think it was from a coffee pot. And he totally reversed the symptoms of Alzheimer's. I think it was in the order of several months. Uh, and, and this was done through the orthosilicic acid. So absolutely, you can totally reverse the symptoms of Alzheimer's. I know the drug companies don't want to hear about it. The MDs don't want to hear about it uh, because they want to keep pushing the drugs and the grants for the research. But that's a done deal. It's, it, the, the problem is that people just don't know about it and they're finding out about it. And uh, you can totally reverse the symptoms of Alzheimer's. And the only reason why you can't is if the Alzheimer's disease has been raging for a period of years and it's destroyed an excessive amount of neural tissue and it's hard to get rid of all those those amyloid beta, beta plaques that have caused all the destruction. That's difficult. The, you can lessen the symptoms, but it's hard to reverse the disease. Once you reach a threshold where a certain amount of neural tissue is destroyed, it's hard to be able to have the brain still function in a manner where you're going to be out, able to operate on a normal day-to-day -day basis. I've worked with Alzheimer's patients years ago, and it's it's pretty sad. And it's it's the day-to-day -day living things that they can't do. They're not quite sure what how you go about cleaning yourself or uh, how you go about putting clothes on or how you go about making food and they don't recognize their family. And it's hardcore. It's really hardcore disease. I've, I've seen it for years. Right. Um, Eileen uh, Trion asks, uh, the vegetables, the organic vegetables that you're talking about, is it best for them to be raw? Does cooking destroy the... Um Okay. okay, there's a couple of things I can say about that. First, it's kind of hard to digest uh, raw vegetables unless you have a uh, good digestion because the raw vegetables are, uh, you need a good bacteria to digest uh, the raw vegetable to get all the nutrition from it. That's why you see people that raw digestion are really toxic and have poor digestion can't digest the raw vegetables. In that case, you need to cook your vegetables and don't cook the, the tar out of them. Just cook them enough so that they're soft enough to eat. When you do that, Oftentimes you make, you may always make them more digestible generally, and you're just going to get the nutrition from the vegetable and, and more so than if it's raw. And of course, some vegetables you're always going to cook like potatoes more or less. And there's a vegetable here, yucca, you have to cook it because otherwise it's toxic. A lot of the plants here are toxic unless you cook them. And that's just to prevent animals from eating them. Plants use or oxalic acid in their tissues to prevent animals from eating them because it tastes terrible. So the plants that have the highest oxalic acid content are the ones that the animals generally don't eat. <laughs> that's how that goes. Um, is autism linked with aluminum? Sorry, is what? Autism. Oh, okay. Autism. Absolutely. Uh, autism is undoubtedly linked to uh, aluminum and mercury and glyphosate. And glyphosate, they all end up in the hippocampus is one area of the brain where they always seem to cross the blood brain barrier and get attached to neural tissues. But um, when I studied autism and mercury, the correlations were exactly the same. The lines of increase were exactly the same going through over the years. In particular, the state of California, they've done a lot of interesting studies. So without a doubt, heavy metals are definitely associated with autism and autism symptoms have been reversed when, uh, when you go through a detox procedure. Uh, uh, detox, detoxification procedures and so on, uh, as well as Parkinson's. I've read papers where people have engaged detox uh, procedures that were very intensive, sweat therapies, liposomal glutathione, uh, intestinal binders, chlorella spirulinus. Some of the new zeolites are nano-sized and they go everywhere and pull all kinds of stuff out. But you can reverse the symptoms of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and don't let anybody tell you that there's no uh, cure for it or there's no cause for it. The cause and the cure are Known. They're just not known widely. People don't investigate. People don't really read the books, but there's books out there. And if you want to know, you can, you can find that information. Right. Now, um, the cookware, we've already discussed about the um, aluminum cookware. Is non-stickware, non-stick cookware in the same category as aluminum cookware? Um, you, you have to be careful there. Years ago, I had this conversation with someone who was adamant that nonstick cookware was really bad for you and it created toxic compounds in the atmosphere when you used it to cook. I, it's getting to the point where it's, I mean, some of my, my clients get annoyed with me. Well, how am I supposed to survive? And it's everything you're saying is toxic, but there are options. I find one of the things maybe is cast iron 
uh, pans that you're using, they seem to be more acceptable. Stainless steel cookware seems to be more acceptable. Uh, mm -hmm. I hear, you know, like nonstick cookware, sometimes it produces co toxic compounds when you when you cook with it. But a lot of people do. I think we have some here, and I can't. I, I don't know. I just don't know. But I can tell you that the cast iron is good, and a stainless steel cookware is a better option. Okay. Uh, now, two compounds I'm quite familiar with myself are both are the uh, glutathione and the EDTA, both chelate. Uh, glutathione to a lesser degree than the EDTA, but I wanted to talk about the glutathione. Mm -hmm. um, glutathione itself has got a very low absorption into the body. If you take it orally, of course, you can mm -hmm. take it intravenously as well. Right. But that's rather inconvenient for 99.99% yeah. of people. So um, you take it in capsule form. And of course, when you buy, one thing I noticed actually is that supplements, when you buy supplements, there's always a tiny, tiny, amount of the active ingredient in there, far too little to actually do any good. Mm -hmm. um, and it costs a lot. So I make my own, but I, I buy bulk powders and I, I encapsulate them. But glutathione comes, um, be because it's not easily absorbed by the body, most of it is just simply excreted. But there's acetyl glutathione, which has been developed recently. Mm -hmm. um, acetyl glutathione is absorbed as well as intravenously, um, you know, um, injected glutathione. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Mm -hmm. In your book, you said that it was surprising that when, when, um, when it's either glutathione or EDTA, I think it's, um, I think it's glutathione. When you, when someone uh, took glutathione, the urine, um, the, the, the levels of aluminium in the urine increased. And you said that was surprising. Why is it surprising? Because, I mean, urine is where it's getting removed from your body. I thought that would be a, a given. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to, what we call actually glutathione. I don't say glutathion. That's funny to hear that. But I'm sure glutathione is just as funny to you. But um, the glutathione in the liposomal form is the one that will be digested by the liver and enter the blood directly. The glutathione taken by itself will be digested. So it really isn't utilized, utilized as well because it's broken down amino acids. The other thing is the N-acetylcysteine. Uh, glutathione is basically composed of three amino acids. That's your glycine. Uh, it's N-acetylcysteine and the other one is glutamate or glutamic acid. And the one that tends to be limiting is the N-acetylcysteine. So when you're taking that, oftentimes it boosts the glutathione in your body. Also the liposomal vitamin C uh, at higher concentrations, say at least five grams will boost the glutathione in your blood considerably. And so that's another way you can do that. I'm not sure what you're referring to as far as um, finding that out. Oh, I think maybe it could have been, look, when we have mercury, we're talking about mercury, 80% is removed through the gastrointestinal tract. Generally, it's very few percentage removed through the kidneys. And oftentimes yeah. you have to understand that 80% of all mercury is stored in the kidneys. So it damages the very organ responsible for helping to remove it. And this. so I know it's diabolical, it's madness, but that's one of the things that happens. So if you have heavy metals and oftentimes even things like arsenic are stored in the liver and the kidneys. So these are the very organs damaged by it. And I know that 80% of all the mercury is going to be attached to something like glutathione and a carrier protein. Mm -hmm. It's going to pass through the gallbladder attached to a fat and goes out through the gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we do is we take intestinal binders like chlorella or spirulina, which attach to the heavy metal and ensure it gets out through the gastrointestinal tract rather than be recirculated relating to the portal uh, hepatoportal vein and get circulate back into the liver to digest the fat further. And that's often where the mercury or the heavy metal gets re-released and what they call redistribution to cause more problems in the human body. It ends up someplace else and it's so inflammatory and toxic. It causes pain and brain fog and fatigue and all kinds of detox problems. And if anybody who's detoxed knows every, all of what I'm talking about as far as um, uh, symptoms of uh, redistribution and, and uh, toxification while you're detoxing. So I think that uh, the main avenues of getting rid of aluminum are sweat and urine. And I was just surprised to see that, I think, probably because yeah. mercury is 80% through the gastrointestinal tract. I was surprised too. Um, okay, nuts and bolts. We're at the end of the summer. People um, are asking me names of supplements. What would you say is the, 
uh, if someone wanted to um, detox um, their heavy metals and aluminium, including aluminium, from the body, what mm-hmm. supplements are, uh, are your immediate go-to that you'd suggest to them? If you can um, tell them what supplements you take. Okay. My, my procedure that I use for all my clients is first to establish what minerals you're deficient in. If you're deficient in one particular mineral, it's going to throw your entire metabolism and it's going to absolutely disrupt your detoxification procedures. Now, when we have a disruption in minerals in the human body, it's always caused by a toxin and in particular the heavy metals because they take the place of the good metals. And then the right. body has a problem with distribution, absorption, transfer, and so on. So I say, get a hair test. It's 50 bucks untreated hair. A couple of weeks later, you get an analysis. Somebody like me or somebody who knows about these things can easily interpret. It's really quick. Oh, well, you're, these metals are too high. You're missing this. If you supplement with that mineral that you're missing, oftentimes the whole metabolism, the detoxification procedures kick into gear and it helps you out tremendously. That's the first thing. Establish uh, you that you have heavy metals by looking at mineral deficiencies. And as you're detoxing, you'll see that heavy metal jump out into the blood. And six months later, after detox, you'll see the heavy metal come out of the in- tissue. It may be low, your heavy metals may be low in the human body, according to your hair sample. But if you see your minerals are all over the place and not in the desired range, then you know that you have a problem with the heavy metals and they're in your organs. Remember, most 99% of all the heavy metals in the human body are stored in tissues. They're not kept in your blood. So when you're doing that hair analysis, it's, it's really representation of three weeks of really what's going on in your blood. It's an average of what's in your blood. So once you start detoxing, the body starts throwing those metals from the tissues into the blood, and then the body has to bind them. And that's where we get into the binders and the chelators. Before we go into that, the easiest and best way to get rid of trash from the human body is sweat therapies. And people ask me, well, what type of sweat therapy? I tell them any kind. You're looking at saunas infrared lights, you're looking at exercise, being out, you go outside in Panama, you walk around, you're going to sweat, gardening, uh, anything, any kind of sweat is wonderful. And it's going to kickstart the whole detoxification process. It signals the body to begin to excrete and it signals the body to dump toxins from the tissues into the blood for excretion. Now, the second thing is liposomal glutathione. Liposomal glutathione has become very cheap. You can make it yourself. If you want to buy the pure reduced glutathione as a powder, you add it to less it than you uh, blend it. You put it in an ultrasonic vibrator, look it up on yeah. YouTube. You don't want to yeah. do that. Buy a liposomal glutathione from a supplement, a well-known brand that you trust. Talk to the company, how they make it. Throw a few curves at them, see how they respond. Uh, Liposomal glutathione in the human body is the best chelator. It's the one that the body normally makes to get rid of trash. Now, a person who's under an insane amount of oxidative stress, whether that be from an illness, a vaccine, a chronic disease, is normally going to be low in glutathione. And that is the reason they got the problem with the heavy metal in the first place. They had the body was overwhelmed with heavy metals. They're poor detoxifiers. Maybe there's a genetic linkage to that. They're not good methylators. They can't get rid of heavy metals. And what happens is the glutathione gets used up. They have low glutathione levels, low vitamin D levels are incorporated or often correlated with that. So glutathione is the second one after sweat therapies. And the third is, and, and then after you engage these for a month or two, engage in a intestinal binder, intestinal binder, chlorella, spirulina, uh, zeolites, they bind the heavy metals in the gut. Now your body is going to get rid of 80% of the mercury through the gastrointestinal tract bound to glutathione, but it could be recirculated, redistributed. That's why we have to bind the metals in the intestine with something like uh, what I mentioned, uh, even yeah. selenium, right? The zeolite, chlorella, spirulina, even mm-hmm. selenium can bind to mercury as mercury selenide. That's how whales and dolphins deal with the high mercury content in their body. They bind it to selenium. They acquire more selenium from the seafood that they eat and they, they bind mercury with s- s- selenium to create mercury selenide. You too can take a selenium supplement. So I would say sweat therapy, liposomal glutathione, selenium, and then the intestinal binders as chlorella, spirulina, and or even zeolites. They've got some really good zeolites that, uh, <laughs> that are really good for you. And very, uh, I, was, oh, I think it's a funny question from Shiroi Monday. It's funny because it, <laughs> I, can read, I, can, I, I, I understand what she's really trying to say. She says, I tried to take notes of Dr. McGraw uh, as you were speaking, but I couldn't type fast enough. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a full-on, it's been a full-on summer. A lot of information. You've got to feel for her. 
Uh, okay. Okay. So what I can tell you is. You, as we're going to mention, this is the, my book. It's the draft yes. copy that I made the corrections to. And it's available on Amazon. It's very inexpensive. It's $8. It contains all of the information on aluminum, the detox procedures, all of the relevant studies, uh, information on the glutathione, all that fun stuff. And so buy the book if you don't want to take notes forever. Uh, it's not like I'm going to give you a quiz at the end of the podcast and you're not going to get a good grade on it. Review the podcast. Go over it again and again. Uh, ask questions to your naturopathic professionals. Uh, get involved. Talk to other people about aluminum. Talk to other people about how they're getting rid of it. It's a big topic these days. You know, people are getting together in groups at the gym or at in houses, and they talk about this. How are we going to do with this? Well, this is what I do. Oh, well, I found a cosmetic that doesn't contain aluminum. And somebody else found a tea that's organically made and doesn't contain aluminum because it's not grown on acid soils and so on. So get together and discuss this with other people, right? Use your cell phone on social media <laughs> to discuss glutathione, to discuss aluminum, heavy metals, to discuss organic gardening, to discuss this book, to discuss your notes you just took and all that. I realize it's a lot of information, but I feel I'm not doing my job if I don't tell everything that everyone needs to know to get out of this mess. One out of every two people is going to die from Alzheimer's above the age of 80. We all know people, uh, our mothers and fathers and grandmothers and so on that we care about that probably are going to develop this disease or have this disease. Look, there's the information. I've given it to you. You can do this. You can help them. They can get out of this. It's not an unknowable disease and there is a cure. So there it is. All the information's in that video. You don't even have to buy the, the book. You can type faster. <laughs> well, you've got to be fair, Bill. You've given a, you've given three or four books of information in <laughs> one hour. So I, I think uh, I, I, this is why I was quite amused when I saw that question come through because I'll be, I'll be in exactly the same predicament, you know. Well, it's, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be recorded. We'll play it over again, you know. Play, it, put it in your iPod and listen to it at night. What about but, that? We you know? will be publishing this video. We'll be putting links at the bottom of the video so people can um, will know where to buy Dr. Bill's books. Um, and, uh, yeah, go at your own pace. <laughs> it's been very enjoyable having you back on this summer, Bill. It's, um, yeah, third time. Third time lucky. It was lucky. It's, um, yeah, I, I, I knew aluminium was bad, but I thought it was not so bad in particular because so many cooking utensils are aluminium. E even now, most, probably I'd go as far as to say most pots are still aluminium and spoons, ladles, soup ladles, and, and all of that. Um, aluminium is a, is a great metal for some types of products because it conducts heat well, it conducts electricity reasonably well. It's non-ferrous, so it doesn't become magnetized. It doesn't corrode so much. It gets a little layer of corrosion, but not very much. Um, so it's stable. It ticks all the boxes except the most important box is, is it going to kill you? <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, we forgot to mention that, by the way, in the small print on some of the labels, there was the word death is there. I know I, I don't know what to say, but it's it's the problem is that in industry they just tend to avoid it or they come up with a, a couple of quick uh, slogans or whatever and whatever. It's not as bad mm. as or hey, mm. we don't really know about it, or look, it can't be that bad. Everybody's taking it. That's and, right. Yeah, That's and everybody's right. getting sick from it too, right? So yeah. unfortunately, they, uh, knowledge is the key. Yeah, and there were these, yeah, and the word, you know, the, the term conspiracy theory was well, because this anime this is just a conspiracy, you know. <laughs> no, actually, I study those. It's uh, this is aluminum is, is old hat. I mean, it's in the literature, it's out there. There's books written, uh, people aren't wearing tinfoil hats. These are these are well known professors, they are, these are PhDs, these are people that teach at universities, and aluminum is just. A heavy metal. I mean, I haven't gotten into anything that's conspiratorial. I haven't gotten to anything that's not published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. It's all out there. Go to PubMed.com, put in aluminum toxicity, and begin reading the, the peer-reviewed papers yourself. They're not that hard to understand once you get going. Yeah, yeah. And the depth of the um, of the journals is quite deep as well. So it's people that don't just take things to face value. They they do a bill and they dive. They dive deep until they <laughs> find the real answers. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for coming on to our show. It's been wonderful to have you with us. Um, yeah, no, it's been, been an amazing summer. Fast forward, so people will have to watch this video. Um, you know, there's the facility of watching it at slower speed. They left to do that. But, uh, no, <laughs> Most what, people actually yeah. actually fast fast forward these days. A lot of my clients come in, they listen to their YouTube videos or whatever, and they put it on 1.5. So you have to listen to this. But actually, yeah. maybe people want to slow this video down. Ha ha, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, normally, I'm normally a two times person when I watch a video on YouTube. Um, but on this one, I think I'd be a probably a half, <laughs> half speed. <laughs> probably, but I got to get it out there. Type A, you know, I've got to get it out there and put that information out there. Uh, when people have questions, there's always one more question. I mean, I talk to my clients for three or four hours the first time when they come in here for arrive treatment and they want to know everything. So I learn everything and I have all the answers only because I'm, I've just driven. Once I get into this, I say, this can't be true. And I go back to the next paper, and the next paper, the next book and the next book. And and I just don't stop till I have all the answers. And once I have all the answers, I want to present them. I got to tell people about them. Nobody, you know, who am I going to tell about this stuff? I got to write a book. I got to tell people, you know, I got to fix people. When I was a kid, I worked on cars. I fixed cars. I was fascinated with the internal combustion engine. Now I fix people. So I, that's, you know, it's where you do what you do. <laughs> thank right? you for gifting us. Thank you for gifting us your time. And thank you everyone for watching this episode of SEMA. Um, I really enjoy um enjoy these seminars and i enjoy the experience that we have on and bill uh this um he accepted our invitation for a third time he's he's a man of uh, a lot of knowledge and um it's, it's great that he's also free with the knowledge he, he gives it out uh so people can listen and learn um please tell other people about the dangers of aluminium um tell them what you've learned during the summer simple things that people may not realize like the deodorants they use anti-acid tablets or or many of the other um nuggets of knowledge that uh, bill has gifted to us today um keep on passing the love forwards and make sure you don't lose your family earlier than their due time it, be a be a be a long-lived family and fill your life with happiness and joy so thank you so much for tuning in and um i'll see you next time thank you bye-bye